welcome to the Thursday edition of the DC Today. The markets closed today pretty close to flat. The Dow was down seven points uh, after being down about 400 points pre-market and then even during trading hours down over 300 and, and sort of came back. So you've had some volatility up and down all week and then uh, some days it was up and lost it and today it was down and lost that and so there you, there you go. Um, a few other metrics of the close in the market and then we'll talk about a few other things. The S&P was uh, down 31 basis points so down a bit but nothing significant. NASDAQ right behind that at 35 basis points to the downside. The 10-year Treasury yield was up 7 basis points, so closed at 3.76%. Uh, not a, a big day uh, on, the, on the bond side of things. Uh, the top performing sectors um, for the market were technology, which was only up 21 basis points, and energy, which was only up 12. And then consumer staples was the only other sector that was even positive. It was barely up. The rest were negative. So on a breadth basis, more was down than up today. Uh, utilities were the worst, down 1.79%. And so some just kind of quirky, quirky stuff in the data. Oil was actually down over 4%, largely on some stories circulating that are kind of calling into doubt this idea of China accelerating the reopening. You can imagine that would be bullish for oil, and there's some doubt as to whether or not that's really in the cards. Uh, so oil closed at about $82 a barrel. Um, I think that's the basic stuff I want to cover on the market. There's a few other news events and economic things I want to talk to you about. The um, yield curve uh, it, at the 210, the two year and the 10 year is 66 basis points inverted. And that caught my attention this morning. I was studying the 210, the 310, the 35, the 1030, and the three month, 10 year. And so it's a lot of different points on the curve, all of which are in inversion. But that 210 at 66 bips inverted is the most inversion since 1981 in over 40 years. So um, really either this yield curve has been inverted long enough and severely enough for long enough that either it's foretelling a recession or the yield curve as a predictive measure is just done. And, and nevertheless, I, I maintain my view that that's all well and good. If one believes, well, we're really getting a great signal from the yield curve here, but the problem is knowing we're going to recession doesn't tell us how deep of one, how long of one, and how much is priced in. So I don't have anything new to say on that that I haven't been really saying to you all year long. Um, the Fed, uh, this is kind of interesting. The Fed um, uh, had a few different governors speaking today. One of them, James Bullard, who tends to be pretty outspoken, he is a voting member now of the FOMC, gave a speech where he said, rates are not yet sufficiently restrictive. His colleague, Esther George, who I've, I've read quite a bit over the years, she said, basically, we need to get a real recession to bring down inflation. So the, the, the problem with that is you have a couple of FOMC governors saying some things, and I don't know if they speak for the whole FOMC or not. And both of these have a, uh, both these governors have a history of changing their mind rather quickly. And Bullard in particular can be one of the most dovish and one of the most hawkish on a whim. And so, you know, the market can read into it, but a day like today, it went down 400, it came up 400, and that was either related to this or not. But uh, I would just say it points to the ongoing instability theme. What is not budging is the futures market read of a 50 basis point hike next month instead of 75. Um, so let's talk a little politics um, and then some economic data. I'll let you go. Uh, Nancy Pelosi um, announced that she will not continue in Democratic Party leadership. The Democrats did surrender majority position in the House, although they did so with much less of uh, carnage in terms of lost seats for the Democrats than had been expected. But nevertheless, knowing that a, a different party uh, speaker of the House is coming, um, and her being at a point in her career and age, she ex expressed a desire for new generation people to come in. And uh, already it appears that Hakeem Jeffers is going to be that uh, replacement uh, 
former Speaker Pelosi. Um, I don't think there's any big market impact to it, but it's worthwhile on the D.C. front to cover. The latest prediction on that house, by the way, um, I feel pretty good about this. Um, and I'm starting to see more of a consensus. NBC has gotten off of there. It's going to be a three-vote lead for the House, and nobody's holding on to the silly stuff about 25. You know, there were some who had been saying 30 before the election, then 25, then maybe it'll end up being 20. And I think I still thought the day after the election that there were enough races within reach that they could still end up at around 16, 17. Um, and then and even that kind of came down from there. Um, as obviously Democrats outperform substantially in a lot of these House races. But I'm guessing you're going to end up at 222 to 213. And at this point now, we're not trying to do a total macro top-down estimate. We're just, there's all the races that are known, and then there's the very small handful unknown, and then you make a projection on each one and then do math. Right where before people were speculating in the context of a more macro statistical model, which is much less reliable. At this point, I do think that there are three races that could go all three your pub and all three dem and switch the math and and bring it to um, maybe plus or minus three from the 222 to 13. But I think that that 222 to 213 captures where it will end. And so a nine vote lead. Um, which again is a lead. It's higher than people thought it could be a week ago. It's much lower than people thought it would be two weeks ago. And yet, nevertheless, um, it, it, here we are. Um, okay, weekly jobless claims came in at 222,000. Not a big move from last week and not much variance from what the expectation was. Um, single family starts in new housing construction was probably the economic data point that got my attention most today. It dropped uh, to uh, an annualized rate of 855000 last month. That's down 6% on the month from where it was the month prior. But it's down 35% now from where its high was post-COVID. So there's just simply no way around the fact that multifamily construction starts are not coming down much. Single-family new starts are... are coming down a great deal for obvious reasons of demand erosion and affordability. Um, that's the bulk of things, I guess, I wanted to cover. Uh, I'm excited for Dividend Cafe tomorrow, uh, talking about the issue of yield and income and what metrics matter to investors to be really practical. And then in terms of um, plans for Thanksgiving week. I'm going to do the long DC today that uh, some of you love getting that I love writing um, that will go out Monday, a long written DC today with the normal format, all the subjects and topics and so forth. What um, I won't be able to do as a podcast or video on Monday. And then on Tuesday, the normal DC today with the market summary synopsis and then a video and podcast from partner Trevor Cummings will come out. Wednesday, to, we'll have a Dividend Cafe, kind of a short Thanksgiving version of Dividend Cafe, all mediums, and then that'll be it for the week. We won't have our client portfolio bulletin Wednesday, and we won't have anything um, on Friday, just in honor of the Thanksgiving week and the reality around uh, my family schedule, your family schedule, and the resources of our team at TBG and where we want to prioritize things. So that's the schedule for next week. And other than that, reach out via questions at thebonsongroup.com. Um, please rate, like, enjoy our podcast and video. Subscribe. And thank you for listening to and watching the DC Today.